Good morning. Let's all join together and worship God. People of God, the Lord is merciful. People of God, the Lord is good. People of God, the Lord is love. God our spirit, so that we may be People of God, the Lord is faithful. God our spirit, so that we may People of God, the Lord is righteous. Let us sing our hymn of adoration, O Worship the King. Kevin, we got a mess up here. Got a page out of sort. Ah, there we go. Persistent and loving God, we are forever seeking for your will to be done on this earth. You learn all creation to live in harmony. Forgive us for growing weary of all the struggle for peace and justice and for courting despair. Loosen our needs to see the full results and to be feel hopeful. Sustain us with the abundance of friends and measure of faith. Give us the willingness to do loving things and to be faithful in the small acts of caring. God of the hidden seed and promised resurrection, work your surprising, amazing grace in our lives and in the broken world. Where prayer for your blessings in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Psalm for the day is Psalm 31, verses 1 through 5. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. Take me out of the net that is hidden from me, for you are my refuge. Let's all greet each other with a hug or a hello or a happy wave. Uh, and the announcements today. What did I do with that paper? I know I put it somewhere. All right. Uh, the October mission is World Mission Offering, helping victims of COVID-19. And as always, the safety precautions. All attendees shall observe social distance guidelines, wear a proper mask, face coverings of all times, both inside and outside in the parking lot. Also, we're singing hymns in a quieter tone. Oh, that's not me. So, so to as minimize possible germ spreading, you may remain seated. Uh, and as the lion's den still closed, and is there any other, anybody else with any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, that's not on here, but yes, the BBS meeting was supposed to be after service. I gather that Priscilla will be here. All right. Anything else? We're the Aragono Sejo family. I'm Denise. I'm Tina. I am Juan Jr. And I am Juan. We are your global servants serving in Chiapas, Mexico with the Council of Rural Indigenous Evangelicals of Mexico. We just feel surrounded in prayer. And it is wonderful to be able that, you know, in a time of need or something, know that we have this group, this network, this partnership that that is there with us, be it through email, through Facebook, you know. When we go to the communities, most of the time we try to work together as a family uh, because we want to model for them what it is to be a family that is serving the Lord. We haven't come here to teach them or to do their work. We've come here to walk alongside them as they are alive and as they are sold in their communities.
Gracious God, Jesus promised his disciples the gift of the Holy Spirit, a gift that remains powerful and transformative today as it was on the first day of Pentecost. With generous and thankful hearts, we offer our gifts to you, our time, treasure, and talent, but most of all, our hearts. You use us in our offerings for your purposes and glory. Amen. The hymn of petition would be, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. This morning's scripture reading comes from Philippians chapter 4, verse 1, and verses 4 through 9. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything in prayer. In supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guide your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, Whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep doing these things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. <coughs>
little reflection on the scripture today. What does the text say? Let's focus on verses five through seven. Commentators have often noted the terse formulation of Paul's phrase. The Lord is near. In Greek, the verb is even omitted, which accentuates the nearness of the Lord. The phrase ought to be read closely with what follows it. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, let your request be made known to God. God is always near, and it takes to drop to your knees in prayer. The nearness of God is temporal, but eternal. And it is precisely through prayer that one recognizes God is near. The subsequent verse supports the reading when Paul immediately exhorts the Philippians, in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. Paul leaves no exceptions to his commands. Since the Lord is near in a supernatural way, you must worry about nothing and pray for everything. Then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will remove any anxiety and worry. Tell me not to worry? Hmm. After all, what's to worry about? We only have apocalyptic viruses to think about. Unemployment, failing businesses and politicians begging you to vote for them. Oh, and we don't like that either. And this is just for starters. Do not tell us to worry, even if it is in the Bible. It's what we do. No one can stop worrying simply by willing it. Impossible. To stop worrying, as the Apostle Paul suggests, involves commitment to the process. The stop worrying process, like maturity, sanctification, and a great wine, is an aging process, something that's ongoing. It happens over time. As we learn to trust in God, who, as Paul describes him a verse earlier, is near. We steadily, we walk, when we walk steadily in faithfulness with God, the worry drops off. We come to a sense of peace that the God we love and trust will guide us on our steps. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. No wonder that when Paul follows this up with verse 7, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. So verse 6 is bracketed by two thoughts. The Lord is near, and the peace of God in verse 7. Do you want to stop worrying? You can't do it by force or will, but you can do it with the relationship with the one God who says, don't worry. You cannot do it by yourself in an instant, but you can do it with God the Father over time. Let us take a few moments of silence. <coughs> Thank you. 
You are just to end the divisions among us. How is this even possible? With fists clenched and jaws set, we grip tightly our perspectives and opinions, ready for battle with who would ever challenge us. Too often we worship the God of being right. Desperate to belonging somewhere, we claim allegiance to tribes of our own making, tribes of doctrine, of politics, of social locations. Our quarrels reach your ears, and even as we stammer out of our excuses, we know it is not your way. Your way is excellent. Your way is relationship, discipleship, neighborliness, and servanthood. Your way transcends the dim thoughts we might fashion from earthly assets. And your way seems impossible for us to even imagine. But help us to imagine it, O Lord God, and we sit in your pews. Let the fellowship we have here continue when we leave this sacred place. Help us to imagine sitting down together breaking bread. Let the magnanimity we feel and express there go with us always. Imagine it is for us, gracious God. Imagine it within us. Show us how to drop the nets filled with our meager catch, which we clutch to ourselves, our paltry security, our self-made identity. Teach us to share. You have a better identity in your mind for us. Make us into your fishers of people. Uh, or perhaps we must simply allow ourselves to be caught by you first. Let us be one community, a tangle of faults and foibles, yet held in your net of grace. This is your way. We long for it too. Amen. Let's sing our hymn of prayer. When peace be alive. Scripture text today is from Exodus, chapter 32, verses 1 through 14. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come make gods for us. Who shall go before us? As for this, Moses, the man who brought us up to the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast an image of a calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel who brought you out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. 
The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Don't let me alone, so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them. And of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord of God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was the evil intent that had brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn your fierce wrath, change your mind, and don't bring disaster to your people. Remember, Abraham, Isaac, Israel, your servants, who you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that is promised I will give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. Amen. Uh, Listen to this list of statements about what they have in common. You only go around once, so you should grab everything, opportunity you get. I deserve to be happy. Surely God didn't mean that that to apply to everybody. I can't be wrong when it feels so right. Those rules were made for peons, not for somebody of my caliber. Yeah. I'm giving so much, exceptions to the rules need to be made in my case. I can do this wrong thing without letting it touch my soul. God knows I'm weak, and he will excuse me. I cannot just be the devil's work. Oh, wait a minute, sorry. It cannot just be the devil's work. Everybody's doing it. Just this once. There are special circumstances, so normal rules, they don't apply. If it strikes you that the common thread in all of these that they sound like excuses to do something outside the standard morality or beyond God-given boundaries of human behavior, you're right. It's easy enough to come to the conclusion when hearing these statements all rolled out one after another but perhaps it's not quite as easy to recognize what's going on when we want to give ourselves permission to do something that pushes the moral boundaries. This link to the scripture text I just read, Moses, busy up on the mountain receiving God's law, and the Israelites becoming fidgety. Moses' brother Aaron leading them into setting up a golden calf and permitting them to carouse around it, acting perversely, as God tells Moses, verse 7. It's not hard to guess what excuses the Israelites used to justify the misbehavior. Aaron told us it was okay. But we have to wonder how Aaron gave himself permission to act the way he did. But before we beat up Aaron too hard, let's admit that people with a whole lot more experience with and knowledge about the God's ways have done the same thing. 
One such person is Karl Barth, once described as the greatest Protestant theologian of the 20th century. He died in 1968. It has been known for a while that Barth had a relationship with his personal assistant, Charlotte von Kirschbaum, in addition to his wife, Nellie. Hmm. However, a 2017 release of a personal letter Barth wrote to Charlotte from 1925 to 1935 has provided detail of the impact of his arrangement on his wife and family. And this information stunned many who, be, who had respected Both as a pastor, theologian, and someone who helped lead Christians' resistance to Hitler and Nazism in Germany. Prior, in 1913, while pastoring in Switzerland, Both married Nellie Hoffman, with whom he had five children. Later, Bach was appointed a professor at the University of Gothenburg, uh, well, Gottingen, Germany. In 1924, he met Charlotte von Kirschbaum, who later became his longtime assistant and confidant. In 1929, he moved Charlotte in with his family despite Nellie's objection. This arrangement lasted for 35 years. Needless to say, it put a strain on everyone involved. Bach's belief that a theologian are not always easy to categorize, but he placed high emphasis on both scripture and revelation, as well as the gospel proclamation itself. In responding to what is known about Bach's relationship with Charlotte von Kirschbaum, Mark Galley, who previously authored a book about Barth, said in Christianity Today, what floored me especially with this rational Barth used to justify the relationship. Galley explained that Barth believed we should ground our theology in the revelation of Jesus Christ as revealed in the scripture and not in our subjective experience. But it's that very thing that Barth fell into himself. Barth felt that he, his relationship with Charlotte Van Kirschbaum felt so good, so right, that it had to be, had to, wait a minute, that it had to have come from God. It just couldn't be evil, Barth wrote to Charlotte. It must have some meaning and a right to live. I love you, he told her, and I do not see any chance to stop this. Most of us have our own understanding of theology, as well as thought out as Barth did. Nor do we have our excuses as well documented. But we can perhaps identify with the idea of giving ourselves permission to sidestep some things, our values, our commitments, things we sincerely, often publicly, embrace. Few of us live up to our loftiest ideas all the time. For instance, we can even let our emotions and temptations dictate how, God, how we understand God's will. Committing ourselves to following Jesus rather than being dictated by our own desire in an enormous challenge. Galley wrote, all of us, any logic available to justify our sins. Self-justification is so woven into the fabric of our souls that it's a lifetime effort to root it out. In fact, we can be sure that we will never rid ourselves of it completely, which in one reason we have friends and spouses. Galley continues, it's my wife more than anyone else who has exposed my pitiful attempts to justify my faults. We might know a man who had been deeply committed Christian 
and very outspoken about his faith. But he eventually engaged in some sexual sins and in the process destroyed his marriage. After that, he went to a Christian counselor and tried to find his way forward. He later said to the to he later said that one of the things the counselor had asked him, given your Christian beliefs, how do you give yourself permission to do what you did? The man went on to explain that at the time, he didn't know the answer to that question. I still don't know the answer for sure, he says now, but he thinks that he had employed self-deceptive reasoning like those listed at the beginning of this sermon. Give ourselves permission to sin is a religious language, but an equivalent term that you might hear in secular settings is moral licensing. It's a phrase sometimes used to describe decisions we make as rewards to ourselves after doing a good job or achieving a goal. But the reward can undercut the achievement. For example, dieting. When we try to lose weight and we manage to drop a couple of pounds by eating only the right foods in the only right amounts for an entire week, we might, uh, come the weekend, give ourselves permission to have some pie and ice cream. Then that leads to making more exceptions, having more frequent cheat days, finally resulting in overall weight gain on our diet. Or we have a particularly productive day on some project that we had been waiting. So we decided to reward ourselves by taking the next day off. We all done that before, only to end up further behind than where we were before. How ironic this moral licensing is most likely to tempt us when we are actually feeling good about what we've accomplished. Elizabeth Grace Saunders, who is a life coach, says that to avoid moral licensing, don't ask yourself, how good have I been? Or how much progress I made? When you're deciding whether or not to give in temptation, instead, ask yourself, how committed do I feel to my goal? And why am I choosing to resist temptation? When giving oneself permission to sin, we might revise these questions to be, how committed am I to following Jesus? And why is it so important that I resist temptation? We cannot guarantee that answering these questions honestly will keep us from doing wrong things. Even the Apostle Paul wrote, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep doing. That is paraphrasing Romans seven fifteen. But those questions are a place to start in understanding that the deliberate movement of sin is a choice. Giving ourselves permission to sin points out that we're kidding ourselves whenever we make justifying excuses. Thank you. Even more importantly, we understand, however, that we can rely on the grace of God, unmerited favor, while we were yet sinners favor, those whose hearts are turned far from him favor. Grace is the scandalous act of God moving toward acting on our behalf of us. The very ones who have violated our commitments and failed to keep our promises. Grace means that our salvation is not dependent on whether we avoid giving ourselves permission to sin, but on God's acting on our behalf in Christ. God's grace is not gussied up version of the God knows I'm weak, 
he will excuse me, rationalization. Rather, God's grace is the assurance that God has not moved away from us, even though we choose to move away from him. Still talking about Karl Barth, Galley wrote, I am a firm believer that good theology can be immense help in leading a godly life. But there is a reason the Lord also gave us prayer and fellowship, scripture and worship, among a host of other gifts to help us grow up into the full stature of Christ. Prayer, fellowship, scripture, and worship are weapons to use against the flimsy justifications we offer to excuse our sins. But in the end, our salvation comes because God is grace giver, and that overrides our permission giving. Amen. May we sing the hymn of benediction. There's a wilderness in God's mercy. Go forth, children of God, as people who are forgiven and who have much love to share with those who have yet to sense their forgiveness, who have yet to experience God's love. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us. Amen.